The world of camera lenses can be super confusing. There are a lot of numbers to keep track of and a million different options out there. It's easy to feel overwhelmed, so lens focus on finding the right glass for your shots. I want this video to be as helpful as possible, so let's start with the absolute basics. What are the most important things to look for in a lens? I think it comes down to the mount, the focal length, and the aperture. We'll dive into each of these things in a little more detail, but for now, for the basics, just remember that the mount determines what camera system a lens will work with. Everything that I'll be talking about in this video applies to pretty much every different camera system, so it doesn't really matter what brand you're using. I use Sony cameras, so I use Sony lenses or lenses adapted to be Sony lenses. And that is a cool thing because you can adapt different lenses to work with different lens mounts. So this is a Canon lens, but I could put this Sigma adapter on it. And now this Sigma lens designed for a Canon mount will work on a Sony camera. I have a whole video all about that if you want to know more about that specifically. But it's also important to remember that not every lens can be adapted for every system. It's not like a universal thing. Generally speaking, it's best to buy a lens that is native to your camera's system. But if you already have lenses or you're working on a budget, sometimes working with adapted lenses can be a total lifesaver. Moving on from the mount, the basics of focal length are the numbers that you see on the lens, some of the numbers. Like this lens right here says 24 to 105. That means this goes from 24 millimeters all the way to 105. The important important thing to remember there is that the smaller the number, the wider the field of view, the higher the number, the more zoomed in the lens will be. But these numbers seem pretty arbitrary at first, so if you want a frame of reference on a full frame camera like I'm using right now, a 35 millimeter, maybe to a 50 millimeter lens is going to look pretty natural, like what you would normally see with your eyes, your field of human vision. I'm using a 24 millimeter lens right now, which is a little bit wider than that, and it still looks pretty natural. But if I get close to the camera, things start to get stretched out. Lenses that are wider than 24 millimeters are usually called ultra wides, and that's where you will start getting a lot more distortion, especially around the edges. Might start to look almost like a fisheye lens, but that also depends on the lens and the quality of the lens. Even two different lenses with the exact same focal length, depending on the quality and how the lens is designed, might distort things and warp things a little bit differently. And the other thing to look at on a lens is the aperture, which is how much light can come into the lens. Just like your eyeball, the lens has an iris that opens and closes, and that controls the amount of light that's going in there. This is definitely the most confusing of the lens numbers to wrap your head around, or at least it was for me. Aperture is measured in f-stop, which has no correlation to anything else in your life in the regular world. It's not like you could relate it to anything else it kind of makes no sense if you're just diving into it. I think that focal length makes sense. A higher number, more zoom. A lower number, less zoom. That is easy to remember. Aperture is kind of the opposite. A smaller number means a bigger aperture with more light. And a bigger number means a smaller aperture with less light. So bigger means less, less means bigger. But it's definitely an important thing to keep in mind. Right up here somewhere you can see it says 1 colon 4. That means this is an f4 lens you'll start to have a frame of reference for what those kinds of apertures mean as time goes on. But the reason it's really important is because the wider your aperture, the more light comes into the lens, which means if you're working in a low light environment, just like your pupil will dilate to let in more light, the lens can do the same. And that means you're gonna get better low light picture quality. It also means if you go like outside into super bright light and you have a wide aperture, it can overexpose things. If you've ever gotten your eyes dilated at the eye doctor and then you walk outside without sunglasses and everything is super bright and painful, same thing for the lens. And beyond making portal-based technology, Aperture also controls the depth of field, which is a fancy way of saying how much of the frame is in focus. Right now, I'm using an f1.4 lens that is set to f1.4. It's a 24 millimeter lens. I am in focus, but the background is pretty blurry. If I were to get pretty close, like here, I'll take the Gene figurine. At f1.4, even something like his nose can be in focus, but the back of his head and his ears aren't in focus. That's a very shallow depth of field, a very small part of the frame that's actually in focus. But those are the three main things to look for, the mount of the lens, the focal length, and the aperture. So with that in mind, if you're looking for a lens, what's the most important thing to look at first? Definitely the lens mount, because it doesn't matter if you get an amazing lens, it doesn't work with the camera that you have. So making sure that you have a lens that works with your camera is going to be super important. There's a mountain of different mounts out there in the world, but if you're shopping on a site like B&H, 
it's pretty easy to then scroll through and select lenses that are only compatible with a certain camera mount and then everything you see you know will probably work with your camera after the mount i think that the next most important thing to look at especially when you're just starting out is the focal length because that really determines when and where you can use a lens almost more than anything else I've got two cameras here for examples, one with a prime lens and one with a zoom lens because some lenses can zoom between different focal lengths and believe it or not, they are called zoom lenses. Other lenses are called prime lenses and those have a fixed focal length like this 24 millimeter lens that I'm using right here is a prime example of a prime lens because I can't zoom in if I wanna to have to actually move closer or further away from the camera. Prime lenses do typically have wider apertures than zoom lenses and it can seem kind of limiting at first to be stuck at just one focal length. But in general, the way to think about a prime lens is that it does one thing, but it does that one thing really, really well. Prime lenses are especially great if you want to use that wide aperture to give you a very blurry background, a shallow depth of field. So here I've got two cameras set to 50 millimeters. The one on the left is using a prime lens and the one on the right is using a 24 to 105 zoom lens. What this means is the shot on the left is what I've got. I tried to frame these up pretty similarly, but I can't zoom in or out anymore with what I've got on the left. On the right, I can zoom out to 24 millimeters, get a nice wide shot, and I can also zoom all the way in to 105 millimeters, which I'm not 105% sure is totally in focus. But what about sensors? Something that might not make sense is that your camera's sensor can change the focal length of your lens, and that, just makes things more confusing. Something you'll hear discussed a lot is full frame versus crop sensor. So this is a full frame camera. This is my Sony a7 IV. You can see the size of the sensor in there. And this is a Canon M50, which is a crop sensor camera. And you can see the difference in size between those two sensors. A crop sensor though is still honestly pretty big compared to something like a phone or a small point and shoot camera. This is still a pretty huge sensor. Sometimes it's called a super 35 millimeter sensor. And then full frame, the reason it's called full frame is because it's the same size as a single frame of 35 millimeter film from the film camera days. Which by the way, I would normally never just leave my camera sensors exposed. I'm only doing it for illustrative purposes, purposes here. Usually makes me super nervous when I see that. So I'd like to censor those bare sensors. So if you have a full frame camera, the number that's on the lens is the focal length you will see. This is a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. That means my field of view is going to be 50 millimeters. If you're using a crop camera, it's going to crop in on that image a little bit. Typically a crop sensor camera has like a 1.6 times crop. So even as an English major, I can wrap my head around this. That basically means you take the focal length of the lens and times it by 1.6. So something like this 24 millimeter lens on a full frame camera would really look more like a 38-ish millimeter lens on a crop sensor camera. There's no real need to obsess over that if you're just using full frame or crop. There's absolutely nothing wrong with just using your eyes and deciding what you like and whatever focal length you like, doesn't matter what it is, as long as it works for you, then you're good to go. The times that this becomes really important is if you're switching between crop sensor and full frame cameras. And there are some lenses that only work on crop and don't work on full frame, but usually most full frame will work on crop usually. But if you have something like a 24 millimeter lens on a full frame camera and you like this field of view, and then you take that lens and you put it on a crop sensor camera, you're going to notice that it's not as wide and that could be a problem if you're not somewhere where you can just switch back to a full frame camera. So you could end up basically using a different lens than you plan on using. And in terms of cost, there really is no difference between prime lenses and zooms. I've definitely had people think that because a zoom lens has many focal lengths and a prime lens has only one, that the prime lens would be cheaper. That is absolutely not the case. There are some incredibly expensive prime lenses out there. And there are also some incredibly expensive zoom lenses also super inexpensive ones. There are a lot of factors that go into a lens's cost that are just a lot more than just the focal length. But if you are looking at prime versus zoom lenses and you think, well, here's a 24 millimeter prime, here's a 24 to 105 zoom lens, why would I limit myself to one focal length when I can have many focal length? And that really comes down to the biggest strength of a zoom lens, which is versatility. But the biggest limitation because of that versatility and focal length is then a limitation in...
after focal length, when you're just starting out, then I think aperture is the next most important thing to focus on. I don't know what else, there's not much else to focus on, I guess autofocus or something, but yeah, aperture is very important. There might be times where it totally makes sense to choose a lens based on aperture over everything, like you know that you want an f1.4 lens and then you're gonna go from there, but when you're just starting out and you're just getting used to everything, I think it's much more helpful to focus on a lens's focal length first and then aperture after that. For the most part, when you're looking at zoom lenses and you want a fast zoom lens with a wide aperture, 2.8 is probably about as wide as you're going to get, at least within any kind of reasonable budget. Most zooms, especially the more affordable ones or even some of the more specialized, like longer ones, tend to stick to f4 or even f5.6, f8 sometimes. It doesn't mean they're bad lenses by any means. It just means you need to know their strengths and their weaknesses. An f4 lens isn't going to be as good in low light as something like an f2.8 or an f1.4. And this is a pretty good example of the difference between f-stops. So there's a lot of depth in the background here between these things. The cameras are here. The figures are there and the background goes way, way, way far back. Both lenses are again set to 50 millimeters. On the right at f4, you can see how blurry the background is. And on the left at f1.8, you can see how much more blurry that background is with the more shallow depth of field. Now, if we look at the 50 millimeter prime lens, even a lens with a wide aperture can be stopped down. I think that's the right way to call it, right? Stop down. If I change my shutter speed here and we go all the way down to like f22, which is as wide as that goes, now, basically the whole thing is in focus. The figures and the background, it doesn't necessarily look amazing, but even we can do something like, let's say F8, which might be nice for like a landscape type of shot or something. We have a little bit of background blur, but not much, nothing compared to f1.8. So you always have that versatility built into any lens, which is why sometimes it does make sense to get a lens that has the widest aperture possible, so that way you have it, better to need it, no, wait, better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Although one trick is that if you have a zoom lens and you zoom it all the way in, it will be much easier to get a blurry background. You'll probably need to back away from your subject, but it's going to compress the background and give you a very shallow depth of field, even if the lens itself doesn't necessarily have a super wide aperture. It's usually a very different story with prime lenses though, on the other hand, because they tend to have very fast apertures, usually something like f1.8 or f1.4. There are other prime lenses that go to like f1.2 and even less than f1, but those tend to be quite expensive because they're super, super specialized. And it is worth noting that a shallow depth of field can make it very difficult to keep things in focus. So it's important to be using a camera that has really reliable autofocus or to spend a lot of time setting manual focus on your camera to make sure everything that you want in focus is actually in focus. Personally, I tend to prefer prime lenses over zoom lenses because I love those wide apertures and those blurry backgrounds. I do a lot of filming indoors, so it's really helpful to have that extra low light performance. And as someone who grew up learning to film on camcorders with basically no shallow depth of field, everything is in focus all the time, the blurry background look, I just love it. I know some people don't love it. I love it and love it or leave it, don't leave it. It can make things a little trickier. It's super bright outside right now. So I've had to put like a nine stop ND filter on my camera to be able to film at F1.4 in the midday sun. And even though I am a prime lens preferer, I still do like zoom lenses, the Canon 24 to 105 that I mentioned earlier. This has been such a useful, awesome lens. The only downside is it's F4, so it's not super amazing indoors. And this right here, the Tamron 20 to 40 millimeter F2.8 very quickly became one of my all time favorite lenses. It pretty much always lives on my Sony a7 IV. It's just so versatile and so, so much fun to use. It's relatively affordable. 20 millimeters is pretty dang, well here I can show you. 20 millimeters is pretty darn wide. If I hold the camera at arm's length, you see this much field of view and 40 millimeters is pretty zoomed in. And what I really love about this is even at 40 millimeters, if I wanna go in further on a camera like the Sony a7 IV, I can crop into super 35 mode. So now I'm going from 40 millimeters to something that looks a little bit more like 64 millimeters. And it's an f2.8 zoom, which a lot of the less expensive zoom lenses out there, even if they say that they're like an f4 lens, as you zoom in, they will start to stop down the aperture to like f5.6 or even more than that as you zoom in. So finding a constant aperture zoom usually means you're going to be spending a little bit more money and finding a constant aperture 
wide aperture like f2.8 can usually be pretty expensive. So this lens for well under $1,000 is amazing. Plus it has super silent autofocus, which is great for doing video. Now I know that this can all seem super overwhelming, especially when you're just starting out. So I do have a few specific recommendations on where to begin. If you don't already have a camera and you're thinking of buying a new one, Get one that comes with a lens. Sometimes this will be called a kit lens. And I kit you not when I say that kit lenses are pretty great. They're not going to excel or be like super extraordinary at anything, but they're more than capable of getting the job done, especially if you spend some time learning a little bit about lighting and how to set your camera settings. You can get some amazing results from just a basic kit lens. And most kit lenses will be something like this, the one that came with this M50. This is a 15 to 45 millimeter lens. You might find something like 18 to 55. For the most part, they usually start at like kind of wide and go to kind of zoomed in. And that gives you enough range to cover most things that you might encounter. But even though a kit lens isn't going to give you the same quality as a specialized prime or a high-end zoom, it will be very valuable in teaching you what you do and don't like. If you're using your kit lens and you find yourself feeling too zoomed in, you have to keep backing up to get what you want in frame, then you know the next time you buy a lens, you might want something wider. If you find yourself always wanting to zoom in more and get closer to something, then you know maybe you're someone who prefers a telephoto lens. Lots of people end up having many different lenses, but it's not unusual to be loved by anyone, and it's not unusual to find that you love more lenses than one. I'm really proud of that. If you are looking for that brand new camera and you want a specific recommendation, at the time I'm recording this, my go-to number one recommendation for quite a while has been the Sony ZV-E10. There's an option that comes with a kit lens. The camera itself is amazing and the lens is surprisingly good. The camera's really good, especially for someone who wants to focus a lot on video. The other recommendation I have, if you don't want a Sony, is the newly released Canon R50, which can come with an 18 to 45 millimeter kit lens. And even there's a kit that comes with an 18 to 45 and a 55 to 210. So if you're in the Canon side of things, that might be a good way to go too. There are less expensive cameras out there, but I really wouldn't recommend any of them, honestly, because even though they're cheaper and they will save you money, they will cost you time and frustration and you're going to feel limited and probably discouraged in using your camera and your lens and then you're not gonna wanna use it and it's just going to be a $500 thing in a drawer. So it's worth saving up and budgeting for at least something like the Sony ZV-E10, which will teach you how to change lenses. It's gonna be tough to grow out of that camera even if you do want to upgrade to something bigger and fancier later on at some point. And if you plan to do talking head videos or streams or video calls, I definitely recommend adding the Sigma 16 millimeter F1.4 prime lens to the Sony ZV-E10, and it's gonna give you some amazing results. The ZV-E10 is a crop sensor camera, so that 16 millimeter lens will end up looking pretty similar to this 24 millimeter lens. I think it's more like 25 millimeters, but you're gonna end up with a shot that's kind of like this with this pretty much the same depth of field. Now, whatever you get, if you're looking to upgrade beyond the kit lens or buy your first intentional lens, I think a great place to start is with a 50 millimeter 1.8. 50 millimeters is a very popular focal length that gives you a lot of very nice natural looking results. Pretty much every manufacturer and every lens mount has a 50 millimeter F1.8 that is relatively affordable. They're not quite as inexpensive as they used to be. They used to be like $100 and you couldn't go wrong with it. Now they're kind of edging up on 200, maybe a little over $200, but they still typically are the least expensive lenses that a company will make. And the beauty with the 50 millimeter 1.8 is that it will start to teach you a lot about prime lenses. You're going to be able to work with a shallow depth of field. And again, you're going to be able to learn what you like and don't like. And because they're relatively cheap in the world of lenses, if you end up not using it that much, you're not going to feel like you completely wasted so much money and oh my gosh, what a tragedy. If you don't use it that often, it's probably always a good thing to have and they really come in handy if you just wanna do like portraits or something at some point. So I always recommend having a 50 millimeter 1.8, even if it's not going to be your main lens, it's a great thing to jump into after your kit lens. And from there, you should start to figure out what you like and don't like and get a better idea of where you might wanna go in your lens journey. And that's where it gets tougher for me to give you a specific recommendation. So 
My last specific recommendation is to rent lenses. The available options kind of depend on where you live, but if you're in the United States, lensrentals.com is a great choice. Sounds like an ad. I'm not associated with them in any way. I've just rented lens from them, rent, lent, rented lenses from them. You can kind of get anything you want for any lens mount for a pretty reasonable price for a week or two. And then you can firsthand experience what you like and don't like about it. So before you invest a ton of money in a really nice lens, spending $100 to rent it for a week or two might be a really smart thing to do. And once you know what you like, don't be afraid to invest in lenses. When I first got my first DSLR, I thought it was insane that people would spend more money on a lens than the camera. I'll never do that. I care way more about the camera body. And I was foolish and wrong because it's very common to spend more money on lenses than a camera body because lens technology doesn't change as often or as frequently as camera bodies do, despite what manufacturers want to make you think when they release new lenses all the time. My best advice to you if you're starting out with lenses is to try out and experiment with as many different ones as possible to figure out what you like. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to know everything right away. It's going to take time, probably years, to really figure out what works for you and what your style is and what you really like the most. But the most important thing is to always have fun along that journey because once the process becomes stressful and frustrating, you're not gonna wanna do it anymore. If you have fun, then everything else will be super easy. And speaking of things that are fun, and easy to sign up for. Thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. And I don't know if this is silly or not, but one thing I was really excited, kind of half the reason I wanted to film outdoors today was to use this microphone, which I've had for a while and I haven't really gotten to use much. And this is the Rode Reporter. It's an XLR condenser microphone, but it's an omni omnidirectional microphone which means you don't have to go back and forth. You can kind of just put it in the middle and it should pick up sound from every direction. So if I turn it, you shouldn't hear really a difference in sound no matter where I'm at, hopefully. I guess if I were a journalist and I were traveling for a story and I took this microphone, then I would really be a reporter on the road with a road reporter. I don't know.